Ain't nobody got time for that. Yo, yo, yo. Duncan Dave here. Leaving the extended stay in Valley Forge or King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. I would not recommend this freaking place any any to anyone. <laughs> it just it stunk. The attitude of the people there stunk. The the accommodations were fine. I mean you get a bed and but they didn't have a coffee maker in the room. And the breakfast that they were supposed to give you was just like packaged danishes and some coffee. They didn't have the coffee there until 6.30 in the morning or later. And then uh, they charged, they were charging $170 a night. Aye, and for that kind of money, I could stay at a dang Holiday Inn for maybe twice. So I would not recommend that place. It just stunk. You suck! You can tell my attitude is not very good today. It rained overnight and it rained cats and dogs this morning. And checkout time was at 11. It's now 11.07 so I'm kind of dodging clouds right now to do the things that I want to do. Which doesn't make me happy. And it cooled off. That's one good thing that happened. I mean, it's not like 85 degrees now. It's like 65 degrees. That's all right. I'll take that any day. 65 day, 65 temperature is super riding weather. It's perfect just about, unless it's raining. If it's raining, then you're cold and wet, which is not good. So, hey, there's a casino right there, the Valley Forge Casino. How about that? I could have stayed there. I don't know how much it was, but I could have stayed there and gambled some. Probably gotten something good to eat, too. I ate at a place, speaking of a place to eat, I ate at uh, uh, was it? Shake Shack, which we don't have those down south. I don't think we do. We don't have them in Charlotte proper, to my knowledge. So I ate there, and once again, what are you buying? I mean, you buy a hamburger, it's $5 for a hamburger, and it's about the size of a Wendy's uh, single deluxe, the tiny one. And you get a piece of, you know, your meat and cheese and pickles and tomato and an onion and, and whatever in a bun. How's that worth five bucks? I, I just don't get it. I'm sorry. I'd rather go to Wendy's and get a dang, you know, Whopper at uh, Burger King or the Wendy's single is still a better deal. So I'm just, I'm just coughing up attitude right now. I'm just not very pleased with the way things are going in this local area right now. So my, <laughs> and the other thing is my backpack. Uh, one of the straps holding it down fell off so I was riding around with one strap holding on my backpack and fortunately my back was up against it up against the, the case so I didn't lose my backpack which would have had everything you know my tent my sleeping bag my sleeping pad shoes uh, my my riding pants everything there I mean I could have lost all that so, I'm headed to Walmart now, which is reasonably close. Gonna go buy some more straps and some bungees and some other stuff. So, this is just, you know, it's part of, part of the deal, but, you know, I'm just got a little attitude right now. No shit. Damn it. <laughs> I'll get over it. Once I get up back on the road, I'll be good. But for now, it's just not that much fun. Alright. Uh, I gotta do my stuff. I'll be back. Alright. I'm at. Uh, probably, most people would say this would be a pretty depressing place. But I'm at the Valley Forge National Historical Site, whatever you want to call it, State Park or National Park. 
and uh, just saw a movie and went in there to the uh, visitor center. It's a pretty interesting place. You know, this is where Washington took his men and they set up camp. Up, the British had taken over Philadelphia, so so Washington needed a way to keep tabs of them. And Valley Forge was the place to go to keep tabs of them. As uh, the Godfather says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. My father taught me many things here. He taught me in this room. He taught me, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Well, that's precisely what Washington did. He kept tabs of them. And um, while they were here, they had to build their encampment, and then they trained. This uh, Prussian dude, Baron von Steubing, shows up, and he's like, hey, I can, uh, I can train your men. And so he did, he started training them. And it worked out real well. Uh, the, the Continental Army was not very well trained initially. And then Von Steuben got a hold of them and he whipped them into shape. Way to go. Thank you, Mr. Prussian. So the tour here is kind of a driving tour. You could take a trolley if you want to, but I don't think I want to do that. So it's kind of a driving tour. So we're just going to kind of drive around a little bit, ride around, see what it looks like. You can see a couple of cannons up here and let's see what we got here. We got some kind of a brigade hut. Encampment tour stop number two. So we'll just go in here and check it out and see what it looks like. This right here is the encampment, the series of huts and buildings that the soldiers had to make. They got here in December and they had all these built by the end of January before it got really, really cold. But they built these things and they put a lot of people in there at the same time so disease was prevalent and uh, the, the guys were starving too because they didn't have enough food because they weren't supplied very well the british the traders and the merchants would sell their food and wares to the british because the british pound was a strong currency as opposed to the american dollar which was worth pennies on the dollar so the merchants really wanted to do business with the British instead of the United States Continental Army. So uh, pretty amazing to think that they could build all their uh, buildings and uh, huts and stuff that they needed to have within about a month. And we'll get into that later. All right, I hope the camera can pick this up. This is an example of the quarters of the enlisted men. They had three bunks where they would stay, uh, one on top of each other. So you would have uh, 12 people into this room. And imagine breathing the air of 12 people in this room and the stink because they didn't have deodorant. They didn't have anything like that back then. So they stunk and they pooped and they peed and their sanitation was bad and they probably had bad breath too so not the most pleasant of surroundings for the soldiers that were in here so a lot of them got sick and when they got sick they were transported off base and they were quarantined until they got better so uh, yeah not pleasant and as we go into, you know, disease was pretty rampant around here. More people died from disease than they did from the battles. That's a fact. So the army surgeon and the army doctors, they were pretty important to the life and welfare of the soldiers later. I hope we can pick this up without a reflection, but this is a, an example of an officer's quarters. Officers were usually uh, people 
that were well off, pretty wealthy, and they would have to supply everything they would need to fight. And most of the time they had a horse and they had their bunk and they had the tables and they would all fit in like in a trunk that could be easily transported. But uh, most of the officers, uh, they wanted to increase their notoriety. So, uh, like Washington did, you know, he, he joined the, uh, uh, the army and everything so he could uh, better himself, so he could get more of a rep. So that's what a lot of these guys did. They, they wanted to increase the rep so they, uh, they would join the army, fight the British. Yeehaw. All right. Imagine if you would, you were one of the farmers that lived around here and uh, you had just harvested your crop and then all of a sudden the Continental Army, about 10,000 people, show up on your doorstep and they take your stuff. They take your fences, they take your goods, they take your wheat, they take your, your cows. All because they gotta eat, because the Continental Army's gotta eat. How would you feel about that? They weren't happy about it. Oh, go get it, dog. <laughs> That's a lab. <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, the, the people around this area, they were not happy that the Continentals had shown up. Not happy at all. And 10,000 people? They took everything for miles and miles around, and from what I read, uh, the land was useless the next season. They could not get a planting of anything in because the army had come in and just decimated, ruined the land for the next year. So, wasn't good for them. And of course, you know, you run out of food, what are you going to do? Not, not be happy. All right, this is an arch that was dedicated to Washington for his service, and it was built in 1917 and dedicated 1917 or 1918. That's uh, like the year after World War I. That's a long time ago. And that was during the time when, uh, you know, victory in war was special. It still is special, but probably not as special as it is now. Well, it's not as special now as it probably was back then because that was the Great War. So, the people of the United States at that time wanted to build this arch. Looks kind of like that arch in uh, France, ded dedicated to Napoleon, but it's a little bit different. And uh, the Freemasons had a big part in this, so if you're a Freemason, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And people enjoying this. All right, the guy over there with the two kids that are jumping around. Uh, I talked to him for just a little bit. He's got a Yamaha FC1, or he had one, and his wife made him sell it. Damn it. Uh, with kids and everything, he he bowed down to the pressure. So, good for him. All right, later on. Do you think Washington would have stayed in one of those nasty log cabins or huts? Hell no. This is where Washington stayed. He wasn't no fool. And he was far, far, far too important to allow uh, for disease to affect him. He was too important to the country. So he stayed here in this very building during the winter of Valley Forge. So we'll go in and check it out, see what it looks like. All right, this is where the clerk uh, stayed and uh, did the work for uh, Washington when he was uh, general in the clerk's office. First one at the top Right here. Eighth bedroom and a guest bedroom. All right, folks, this is uh, Washington's office. We think. I just talked to the ranger girl here who said that this is most likely his office. 
and this is just a plain old uh, building and everything. But uh, Washington paid for it. I mean, he he rented the the house and he paid the owners for the rental. And I didn't ask the ranger lady about uh, all the other stuff that was paid for by the army. And they had, uh, you know, armies. They didn't just have the men. They had the suppliers. They had the, the people that would fix things, the farriers and all that kind of stuff that would go along with them. And I'm assuming that they had their uh, ladies that followed along too. I don't know. That was very popular in, in the Civil War, but I don't know if it was very popular in the uh, Revolutionary War. So I'm going to ask the lady here if they had uh, lady friends that followed along. I'll get back with you on that. All right, folks, I just talked to uh, the ranger lady, and she said that the ladies, the working ladies, were kind of run off by Washington. And what they allowed was uh, the w wives of the soldiers. Because imagine this, you have a soldier, he goes off to war, the wife is back home, she can't make ends meet, she's got kids. What's she going to do? Uh, so she heads heads over to her husband and she's there with him helping him out so that's what happened this is Washington's bedroom Washington slept in his bedroom how about that father of the country slept right here pretty cool all right I don't think he had purple purple canopies though maybe it's a little bit a little bit different but uh, pretty cool this is where Washington slept Got another room right here. Maybe his aide slept here. Maybe his secretary, whoever it was that helped him out during the planning of the war. And uh, all that good stuff. Looks like all the wood and everything here is original to the house, too. Pretty cool. Here's another room where somebody probably slept or did sleep. Probably another secretary or something like that or an aide to Washington. They would have a trunk or two that could be easily transported on a uh, cart. And I, everything they could, ha they, could keep, they had that they needed would stay in that trunk. And then when they would go to another location, they would unpack the trunk. That's why we call them Navy chests now, because they can travel so well. If you got a Navy chest, you know what I'm talking about. All right. That's it. That's the house right there. And then we come over here. And just like in Mount Vernon, the kitchen is separate from the rest of the house. Pretty smart. It gets hot in here. And it's also a huge fire hazard to the rest of the house. So this is where they would cook. And then when they would eat, they would gather it up and they would bring it into the other house. Now there's a table and chair over there. I can see that through the door. So they would cook and they would bring it inside. And that's smart. They had a pot for cooking, a fire, and all the stuff they needed right in here. All right. All right, remember at uh, Yorktown I talked about a readout? Well, this is one of them right here that Washington used, not uh, not the British. And what they did is they dug a trench on one side, they took the dirt from that trench and put it over on this side, and then uh, they had baskets lined up, and that would act as a stabilizing force, and they would line the that area there with those baskets filled with dirt, and then they would put sod on top of it to prevent damage from cannon fire. Pretty ingenious in their day and time. You know, if you wanted to prevent somebody from coming over here and taking you over, you'd, you would d dig a uh, moat, basically. That's what it really is. It's a moat, except it wasn't filled with water or anything like that. And you got some of the period correct cannons over there. That's pretty neat. They they knew how to commit war, no doubt about that. You know, um, that's the continental style of war. And then in the South, they fought guerrilla type war, which was a little bit different. Kind of hit 
and go, hit and go, hit and go. And that was very effective too. We'll get into that sometime maybe on another trip. All right. This is an assembly of the artillery that Washington would have used in his day. And these are called 16 pounders. I guess they would fire a 16 pound cannonball, something like that. But the artillery was generally located in the center of the camp and they could move it wherever they wanted to, wherever they needed to in a rush. So it's pretty efficient for them to do that that way. Uh, fortunately, there wasn't any fighting really at Valley Forge because the British were encamped in Pennsylvania and they didn't want to have to get out here in the winter. That was smart. Smart of them. And I don't know how many people we lost at Valley Forge from the American side, but it was a, it was a lot. And uh, I bet the British fared a little bit better than we did at that time of, time of the war. All right, on to the next one. All right, we're still looking out here at uh, Valley Forge and where the troops were. And here's a statue of Major General Frederick Wilhelm von Baron von Steuben. And this is a dude that came over that went up to Washington and said, I'm your man, I'll get your people whipped into shape. And he did it. And he was from Prussia. And I don't recall where I heard it, but he said he made it all out like he was the, the Mac Daddy of training and that he had trained all these people. But I think I saw it on the History Channel or something like that, that he was a fraud. He was like a private in the Prussian army. So he didn't really, uh, he, he wasn't really that statuesque at all when he, uh, when he was over in Prussia, but when he showed up here in America, he was like, I'm the man. And I guess that's one adage that we can all use. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> And he did it, man. He, he got our troops into shape, and then they were a fighting force to be contended with. And it would not have happened if he had not shown up here at Valley Forge. So he is another gentleman that we owe an awful lot to. So thank you very much, Baron von Steuben. <laughs> All right, next. All right, guys, that was it for Valley Forge and the tour there. And I'm tired. I, mean, I was trying to find another place where I could camp, but I'm tired. So instead, I found the Valley Forge Motor Court Motel. <laughs> and it is exactly what you would expect. A motor court. <laughs> Had a nice little Indian lady inside there. She looked at me like I was from outer space or Mars or something like that. She goes, don't you have a car? And I said, no, I'm on a motorcycle. She just looked at me like I'm just stupid. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you the inside. He, whoops, I nearly fell. <laughs> oh, here's the inside of the uh, motor court. Look at that wood paneling. Oh my goodness. And there, it's got AC. It's got a TV. I don't think it even has Wi-Fi, but that's okay. I don't care. That's it. Look at all my gear. I got all that stuff I looted up on the bike. So that's it. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, anybody that subscribed to my channel, I want to thank you very much. I really do appreciate it, and I hope you'll share it and uh, like it and everything else. Because this is going to be an adventure. It's just, it's just fun. Let's have fun with this, guys. So uh, until next time, Donk and Dave out. Zapatero, ¿qué opina usted del gobierno de Zapatero?